Right, greetings gentle viewers, good readers, potentially bird lovers, and just generally anyone who watches, and I want to sp specifically thank anyone who has subscribed, liked and commented, because as another YouTuber recently pointed out, I've nearly got 200 subscribers, and Yes, that's minuscule compared to the thousands that some people have, but I am actually very thrilled that at least 200 people enjoy my book reviews enough to have subscribed to this channel, or maybe you just appreciate birds. That's good as well. I appreciate birds. Anyway, onward to today's review, which is for Fuzzy Sapiens by H. Beam Piper. Now, this nice condition um 80s ace book it's a bit faded on the edge there as you can see but it's got the full wrap around cover art really love the cover art for this one and this is the one that i received in the 80s at the same time that i received little fuzzy as you'll see they're both in reasonably good condition and that is due to the fact that against recommendations of some people these days i believe i contacted it so they're in good condition that's enough no more head um, I'm very glad I did that. May not be recommended for a collector, but it's made these books survive the decades really, really well. Now, one of the reasons that I'm rereading them is because I recently got my ch a chance to pick up Fuzzies and Other People, the third book by H. Bean Piper on the topic, which I hadn't previously owned or read. And as you can see, even though it's an ace from the same era, this is in much less good condition than my two contacted books. So, Fuzzy Sapiens picks up at the from the end of Little Fuzzy. The court case between Friends of Little Fuzzy versus the Chartered Zarathustran Company has concluded with the fuzz, Fuzzies, uh, with the Fuzzies having been recognised legally as being sapient creatures. They are people rather than animals, and. The chartered Zarathustra's company, which controlled the whole world, no longer does because it no longer has a charter. It's no longer a class three uninhabited planet. It's a class four inhabited planet. At the time, I might have got that wrong. One of those around the way. But basically, you start off on this planet. Everything has been turned on its head. The company that has controlled it from its inception and has made it a well has made a lot of money doing so has made it quite a wealthy uh, world they own the spaceport they own all the trade and all the farming pretty much they don't have any charter anymore so at the end of the book one of our protagonists Ben Rainsford who is an ecologist was ordered by the judiciary to become a temporary government governor of the planet and organize for legal elections in the meantime, he can't actually tax anyone, um, so the government is running on empty. The previous gov colonial governor was basically a figurehead who was put in place by planet Earth. So everything, politically speaking, is completely upsidaisy. And this is a more political book. Now, every other time I've reviewed the two Fuzzy books, this has always come a bit of a cropper compared to Little Fuzzy. So I've given, I've gone as low as giving this three stars, but when I read it a bit more, I guess, analytically, this is a marvellous book. This is one of the better science fiction books out there. The writing is beautiful. It's beautifully written. It's incredibly descriptive. The characterization is excellent. The world building is almost beyond the par. The only reason it doesn't get five out of five every time I so much as look in its direction is because it's the direct sequel to this one, which is an absolute gem. They're one of the best books in my extensive library and one of my all-time favourites. This time reading Fuzzy Sapiens, I enjoyed it a lot. And because I'm reviewing them now, I sort of think about what I'm enjoying more. Now, with Little Fuzzy, pretty much, I think, all I did in, in the um, review was rave about how marvellous it is about the writing, about the science, which is all my favourite biologies, ecologies, etc. 
about the characterization because there's so many characters in these books and each one has such unique and such evolved characterization it's absolutely great anyway i stand by everything i said about little fuzzy but i was so busy fangirling about it that i kind of bypassed how good the science is and how good the predicted future is with this one i had more time to notice that so the science that H. Beam Piper writes is strongly understated, but it's incredibly well predicted. Now, my ace copies are from the 80s, when I believe these books came into the public domain. But Piper himself died, and I've only recently found that he suicided, probably more on that in my next review, uh, in the 60s. So these books were all written before I was born. They were written in the 60s. They have dated incredibly well. They aren't many writers from the 60s who you pick up the book and you could virtually assume it's contemporary and with these ones i really think you with a couple of very minor exceptions i think you can so in this book victor gregor who's kind of the villain behind everything in little fuzzy because he's the head of the chartered zarathustra company but since they lost out in the first book he was the villain behind the machinations of trying to get the fuzzies declared non-people, trying to get them exterminated, all these other things. But here he is, with the remnants of his company, trying to resurrect things from the dissolution that they're currently experiencing. And he's doing not too bad a job. When one day, all of a sudden, he finds a little fuzzy in his own apartments at the top of the Zarathustran company tower. So first of all, he wants to know how it got there, and then he's determined to get rid of it, and then he becomes attached, as every single human being ever uh, seems to, who comes into contact with the fuzzies. He calls him Diamond for a really funny reason that's got less to do with the gemstones than historical um, anecdotes. And off we go. So that means that our bad guy from the last book becomes one of the good guys in Fuzzy Sapiens. And that's really interesting. And absolute kudos to what H. Beam Piper did here. There's not too many people that I've read who can take someone who is the out and out villain in one book and redeem them so effectively, believably and subtly as H. Beam Piper did between Little Fuzzy and Fuzzy Sapiens. Victor Gregor becomes a kind of central character to what happens in this book. And the explanation of his character that allows him to do this is fascinating. And again, subtle. So basically, Victor Gregor truly doesn't understand how anyone can hold a grudge against him, even though he's trying to exterminate the Fuzzies because he failed, and now the fuzzies are people and he just doesn't understand why everyone doesn't accept what the past and get on with life ben rainsford who's in charge of the planet can't do that quite he still sees uh grego as the bad guy and a couple of other people from the now charterless zarathustra company are also seen by him and by some of our heroes from the first book don't chew that book don't chew that book either um also as bad guys um victor grego so victor grego having got this fuzzy uh, takes him to work the next day and while victor is in the office doing office ceo type things they don't call them ceos here by the way i think that's more contemporary than 1960s to speak his fuzzy diamond um runs loose and gets into the computer room the computer room has got a whole heap of lit lights and fuzzies have got an artistic sense as well as a color sense and he rearranges the computer lights to make a pretty pattern the very fact that you have got this computer room written by someone from the 60s is future predictive science at its best the 60s didn't have computers the 60s had cards that you could punch holes in and put in a machine and here you've got a computer room that controls the whole business, all the predictions that 
outputs in various terminals. You've got essentially a computer, though it's lightly described, that is entirely contemporary with 2024 and was written in the 1960s. It's like I can't tell you how awe-inspiring that should be. Now you've got other types of signs. So when Victor Gregor rec re recognizes what's happened here, he picks up a device which is described a little bit like a mobile wide scanner and he holds it up and scans the computer room in order to show it to the computer technician who swears profusely, which is what you'd expect a computer technician to do. But the device, he's talking about a handhold camera that he can widescreen shoot the computer room and send the image to someone via phone. And just then it started hitting me how much of the science that HB and Piper has been using is extremely contemporary to the 2020s and is way, way ahead of anything that most people were, were predicting in the 1960s. Really impressive. So the scanner and the computer rooms. When this ACE copy came out of out, back then we still had to hook up a cassette player to the back of your television and put a cassette, an old school two spool cassette in in order to play a computer game and you had to be able to speak to it in html i think it was html code language anyway and two decades before h beam piper was writing about computers that are contemporary with the 2020s it's absolutely amazing there's other things that have dated not dated so on zarathustra mallory's port is the main city it's the only city the the rest of it's kind of outbackish um, it's a city that has been designed with no ground traffic. So Adrian Piper has envisaged a future in which all traffic is air traffic. They travel on air cushions. So you don't have the roads and you don't have the kind of profile that a modern city would. And again, he, des he describes this very lightly and very delicately, but it is really, really interesting. And the feeling is futuristic even today. So he's managed to do this thing where not a lot is dated. Um, I will say that one thing that has stated in these books is that the women who are good characters and whom I like, as soon as someone gets engaged, their employer has lost her. Now, of course, in the 60s, at least in Australia, and I believe in the rest of the world, once you got married, you basically lost your job because as a married woman, your new job was to take care of your, your husband and pump out babies. So no government employee as a female was allowed to keep her job after she was married. And you can kind of hear echoes of this in the fact that every woman who gets engaged and gets married is no longer an employee in the way she previously had been. But even so, Ruth Ortheros from the first book, who becomes Ruth Van, Ry Van Rybeck in the second book, she still continues to work as a scientist, even after her marriage. So even that... Not so much. Okay. The way H.B. Piper writes television sets is also interesting. Basically, he's got characters that are forever having Zoom meetings. <laughs> They've got these huge television screens way ahead of the size of the sort of things it used to have um, in the 60s. More like the big flat screen televisions that we have today. And they could hook up their phones to them and have teleconferences, which I'm going to say again, way ahead of science. It makes it feel contemporary to today, but when it was written, it was a pure speculative fiction. And there are small things like in the office tech, it does talk about what basically sounds like a fax machine. They can transmit messages in ways that feel a little bit dated but would have been way ahead of them in the 60s so the way it's described it never really feels outdated and it is excellent writing of characters there's a lot of characters in this one of the reasons i didn't like this as much when i was young is there's a lot of politics so you've got the politics of this of this world which is no longer what it used to be. The Fuzzies have come out, about, out as being sapient creatures. Um, half the population of Zarathustra want to adopt them and take them home with them. The Fuzzies also want to be adopted. They think that living with big people is a good way to survive. 
And now in Fuzzy Sapiens, the question also arises of how few children they are. Of the hundred or so that fuzzies that are described in the first book, there's only one child. And this is where people realize that the reproductive rate is way below sustainability. And they start looking for reasons why fuzzies aren't multiplying, aren't having viable children. And they start learning to talk to fuzzies. So there's a lot of sociology there, a little biology, a tiny bit of embryology, and chemistry. But primarily, this is a political book. So even though it's decades old, I'm not going to talk too much about what they discover about um, the reproductive capacity of the fuzzies. And I'm not going to talk too much about it in general because I think if you like classic science fiction and you haven't read this, then what are you waiting for? You should be reading Little Fuzzy and you should be reading Fuzzy Sapiens. I know not everyone loves Little Fuzzy as much as me, but these books really are, in their own way, quite iconic for the 60s, quite iconic for the 80s when Ace published them. And today, they should be iconic because they actually do things better than many far better recognized books and far better recognized authors. One thing about this, in the end, they've reached a point where pretty soon all fuzzies will be able to talk with big ones. They can already communicate with um, big, big ones, that's humans, putting an earplug in the ear because the fuzzies talk an ultrasonic. And it's considered that that to have evolved in the forests where if they spoke in ultrasonic, the other mammals of Zarathustra wouldn't be able to hear them. So it was an evolutionary trait. There's a lot about evolution in here. Um, but in this book, Victor Grego commissions a device where Fuzzy can hold it up and talk, and that converts the fuzzy wavelength to one that humans can hear, so there can be direct communication. And we've reached a point by the end of the book where uh, fuzzies and humans can communicate. A lot of humans are already speaking fuzzy language. Fuzzies are sort of turning to a pigeon language that's part human, part fuzzy, which is really interesting. And right at the end, we've got this moment where... Fuzzies, little Fuzzy is thinking there were still so many things Fuzzies had to learn. But basically, little Fuzzy is looking at a future in which, by their existence and sharing life with them, Fuzzies are making the world better for big people, for humans, by making them safe and giving them good food so that there'll be more babies. Big people are making things good for Fuzzies. So basically, it's looking forward to a future with... Little Fuzzy and Human Cooperation. Really enjoyed this book. I think the politics which bogged me down when I was younger are more interesting me to me now. The idea of suddenly being handed a whole planet whose economy you need to manage probably pretty much passed me by when I was an arrogant young teenager, but these days it just makes me want to gibber with horror, which is pretty much what it does to Ben Rainsford, the ecologist who gets handed that particular hot potato. Um... Many, many other things about this book are good. It is, as you can see, much, there's much more of it than Little Fuzzy. I don't think it's got that every single word is a gem feeling that the first one does, but it's still exceptionally good book. Really enjoyed it. And having finished those two, I'm moving on to Fuzzies and Other People, which I will hopefully be the next book to review. Once again, thank you very much for watching this. Thank you for liking and commenting and watching and subscribing. And especially thank you to all those subscribers because I'm about to hit 200. And that's really exciting. There's 200 people out there who love listening to me natter on about books, which are at the moment mostly classic science fiction and fantasy. Thank you. Have a great day. Read good books.